Okay, so here we go. Can I have my rings? One. Right no whispering in the background. You can hear us out here. This is Winged Productions. Here we're on the air right now. One. Two. Mm -hmm. no. I can take it in. Wait. I can't talk while I'm going, okay? So just hold it till I finish the song. Because the song is the thing you gotta understand. <laughs> There you go. Very nice. Light. Very nice. I have my audience here in the studio, but that's called the Limehouse Blues. And it's actually played at up tempo, but it's actually a blues number. And it's actually about the plight of the China person who works in a Chinese laundry in the Limehouse section of London. And mm. unbelievably, when I was over there, in the 70s, and as you all know, if you, or if you don't know, I went out for about two and a half years to study Scientology, but I also played and I did an album over there. When I played in London, I played at this club six nights a week, and it was right next to the Limehouse area of London. Mm. Anyway, just for your further uh, enlightenment, that song was written in 1922, and Douglas Ferber wrote the lyrics, and Philip Graham wrote the music. And um, maybe next week or one of these weeks, I'll bring the lyrics on and I'll read them to you. They're very interesting, really creative. And as I say, it was written in 1922. It's a jazz standard. And um, well, there you go. So now, where do you go to hear an interview? And the host comes on and plays a hundred year old horn, which was made <laughs> 15. And a song, I mean, many of these are a hundred years old or just a little bit less or sometimes more. Well, I'll tell you where you go to hear it. You'll go to hit this program, Life After Scientology, and I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. So welcome to this episode. And uh, before I get into the interview, and I have a great interview for you today with one of your favorite guests and mine as well, a virtuoso as far as remembering things and just her take on it, it's wonderful. You, you all love her, so let me take care of a little business first. And that is we have two patrons, uh, one, two new patrons, Claudia Gurley for $5. Claudia, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. And Chris O'Connor for $1. And thank you, Chris. And as again, very much appreciated. Now, for any of you, though, those out there who don't know what this is, I think that's the real minority of you because most of you are uh, pretty hip to digital, not like me. Um, it's a way for you to contribute to the show and become a participant instead of just somebody who's watching the show. Because anything you give is going to help us keep this show going. We don't have a sponsor, which I've mentioned many times. So we depend on people becoming patrons and other things like that. But anyway, if you'd like to join, you're more than welcome to. And uh, just go to my website, therealronmiscavage.com, and it'll show you how to do it. So meanwhile, without any further words from me, I would just like to bring back a guest, Karen Delacarie, and uh, welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you, Ron. Good morning. Hello. Okay, so we got a great show today, and we're going to talk about John Travolta. So uh, sit back and then get enlightened and... Let's see what Karen has to say, and it should be very interesting. And to start it off, I like to start all of our shows this way. Of course, John's not on the show with us. But would you tell us how John got in Scientology? That I think I'd like to hear that. And Of course, I do know, but for our listeners. Go ahead, Karen. John was brought into Scientology by a, a, a very unknown actress called Joni Prather. Um, Joni just dabbled in Scientology. She was in and she left and she fled in the 70s. But she got John Travolta in. And 
even though Scientology tries to take a lot of credit on John Travolta's career, he, in his own merit, in the show Welcome Back, Cotter, had his own talent. This had nothing to do with Scientology whatsoever. He already had talent. But before I get into that, I just want to say that John Travolta is an extraordinarily affable, likable person. Yeah. Um, in, now, yeah, please. Did, oh, oh, you, you've known him for years, Ron. Karen, I'm going to tell you. Tell me. Tell me. I'll, I'll tell you about John. Uh, back in the 70s, when we used to, when I say we, that's myself and my first wife and my children, we used to go down to the Flagland base uh, to get services. Not the kids, but my wife and myself john used to hang out with us mm. and i'll tell you i just enjoyed his company and he enjoyed ours you talk about a nice individual you, yeah. you, if you're going to teach somebody how to be nice to get along with people and be very affable whatever school he went to to learn i would advise you to do it because you just don't get nicer than that that's my take on john travolta so before we get started I want everybody to know that that was my experience with him. A, a genuinely nice person. I, I I do feel he's misguided. And I don't think he, he just doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He really does not. Yeah. John is not. John is a, is truly I, I, I don't think anybody who's really hung with him and spent time with him would say anything bad about him but talk about being misguided oh i want to put this picture up here am i doing this right just raise it about three inches karen there 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 you go all right so here's john travolta on an e-meter taking a rundown a counseling rundown called false Purpose Rundown. And what that is, is counseling to get your evil and to get your crimes. And here he is endorsing it, holding it, one more time, holding the e-meter and letting this be published in one of their publications. Yep. Boy, if that isn't an endorsement. Okay, I want to add something right at this point because this is a little inside information that maybe a lot of people don't have. So just let me tag it in here and I'll let you run again. It's called the False Purpose Rundown. It was called that as a public relations because if they were to advertise it, come and do <laughs> your evil purpose rundown, who <laughs> would have signed up for it? So that's why the name was changed, because in Scientology, man is considered to be good. So anything that strays from that is false. You tr tracking with me? Well, of course you are, Karen, but the people out there. So that's why it was named the False Purpose Rundown. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up as a little. That man is basically good. Is. Yep. <laughs> 80% of Scientology in this day and age is going after your evil, your overts, your crimes, your slimy acts. That is what Scientology is. Almost before you can do anything, you've got to have a sec check. And a sec check simply means a confessional to ask you, your dirt what have you been up to since the last council that that scientology has toppled and pendulum swung into an entity that just wants your crimes so how does that go with man is basically good how, how does that even align but you see people like john travolta tom cruise ron they experience a, a really different version of Scientology than you than the rank and file. There's a president's office teamed with a whole bunch of staff that do anything and 
everything to pamper you from valet parking your car the moment you arrive to having your own steward to give you whatever refreshments or food you you treated like royalty you're basically treated like a rock star that that, that that's what, and you know this is done with very much looking at what that movie star can do for scientology yeah quid pro quo one of the most astounding things about travolta was <laughs> shall i really dive into this yes <laughs> a resounding yes Th this is not done with any uh bad intent towards john john is deeply deeply misguided yvonne Chench assigned spanky taylor to be his personal assistant she's spanky was a seal member right and she took incredible care of john but i think his pinnacle was saturday night live oh those dance moves and that music right then his career slumped till he was to chosen to play the president in the movie primary colors and this is where the shenanigans start. This is where the shenanigans start. At the time the movie was in its final stages about to be released, the United States had Monica Lewinsky's story all over the media. And it was bad for President Clinton. You know, you could tell people about what that was about, Karen. Just fill them in on that. Well, Monica was an intern. The White House has uh, programs where young college students can come and learn the way things move within the White House. They intern on how the communication flows, how appointments are made. It's sort of secretarial administrative assistant work. And Monica had, um, Monica and President Clinton had very private times together, intimacy together. Right. And intimacy can take various forms. And that's when President Clinton made that famous statement it depends what your. <laughs> It depends what your definition of is, is. Do you remember that? Yeah. What it is. It. So President Clinton was in a, in, a, in a glum period. And here was this movie coming out about him. And movies have quite an effect on the culture. A big movie watched by millions of people influence the way something is looked at they get right into culture and president clinton did want to look good he didn't want to look like a high sex fiend who just grabbed every woman he could get to get in their pants he didn't want that image and at this time, Scientology was blowing up in Germany, as it frequently does. Yeah. The Germans, after their trauma of what happened to the cult of Hitler, are very allergic to cults and high ideology in groups. <laughs> They're yeah. traumatized by high, high ideology going off the rails. So, duh. And Scientology has been under scrutiny by Germany's secret service for decades. So a deal was done. And John Travolta was supposed to make President Clinton look really good and come off very favorably. And in exchange, Germany was supposed to be handled 
I want to read you a small thing to see how the State Department was used. Do you know what President Clinton, do you know what he did? Of he course. assigned the National Security Advisor, Sandy Berger, to be John Travolta's personal liaison. Can you imagine a National Security Advisor being assigned to someone? The whole, the whole premise here, let me finish this little story, Go ahead. was that the movie had to promote what a decent, good, great goodness in Clinton. That's what the movie had to come out as. And then there's a very, uh, there's a writer, investigative journalist called Linda Massarella, and she and other journalists really dug in to find out well, <laughs> what is the deal here. And do you remember a magazine that came out? I think it only came out in one issue. It was called George. It was the magazine of JFK's son, John Kennedy Jr., who went down in the Atlantic Ocean in the airplane. He, he became a publisher and he put out this magazine, George. Well, in George magazine, uh, it was, you know, Travolta said how he met with Clinton and he said, I will help you with your issue on Scientology in Germany. And Travolta admitted to this. And in exchange for making President Clinton look good in primary colors. Right. If, if, any, if anyone listening to this really wants the scoop on this, just type in the word Karen, K-A-R-E-N, Donovan, good Irish name, Karen Donovan Block. And Karen goes step by step by step to unravel the secret White House shenanigans with John Travolta and Germany. Wow. So this was using high people in high places. And your son has had a history of doing that, no? Yes. Get the Tom Cruise stories. Yep. Yeah, I, I do remember that hearing about this George magazine. I never actually read it, though, but I, I remember the name for some reason or another. But I also saw Primary Colors, and I'm telling you something. That was a puff piece for the president. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. But, but the main point is that this was an exchange done to make... For, for Scientology, this yeah. was this was dealing in the corridors of power, shaking hands and using influence. Yeah. Right? So John let himself be used. I want to show one other picture of John Travolta. Tell me if I'm holding this up right. Y yes, but you, Karen. Listen, you remember you have to talk. Otherwise, okay, okay. So here, here's the thing. This is John Travolta posing with the technology of Scientology in these volumes. This is what Hubbard wrote, and look how John is using his celebrity and his body and his image to sit in front of. Hubbard technology. Yep. Yep. You that see, John, John, John is one of these people who will not look at both sides. No, no, he won't. There are two sides to every story. The internet is absolutely full, full of the other side. The darker side of Scientology. Yeah, you, you but, know, what, Aaron. I'll tell you what I'd like to do before you get too further in, too, too much into this, because now you could see John acting as a power terminal in the world. You know, he's hobnobbing with 
the president of the United States. It's the most powerful man, actually, if you look at it, in the world. Yeah. And this, he got to that position in life. Could we just do a little flashback or whatever you want to call it to when he got started and he did Welcome Back Carter. That, that was yes. a good one. Vinnie Barbarino, I think it was. Yes, yes. And But then in yes. 1975, Excuse me, that's when he had Vinnie Barber. In 1977, um, he did Saturday Night Fever. We, am mm. I correct on that? Yes, yes. That was and that, that made him an international superstar. <clears throat> yeah. Saturday Night Live be <laughs> became an iconic movie for dance and culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that, that pose that he did with the white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that. Yeah. that in a lot of people's yeah. memories. I mean, even yeah. if you weren't even alive, you know about that yeah. in those days. But then, um, let's see, what, what, did, what did he go after that? He did, uh, was it Greece that he did with Olivia Newton-John? Yes, 78 was Greece with Olivia Newton-John. Again, he showed up very good singing. And, see, he, 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 he's not just an actor. He really has talent in dance, right? Well, yeah. I remember he came and sang on an and El Ron Hubbard yes. album. Ah, tell him about that. To our studio. And I'll tell you, the guy could sing in tune. He had a nice voice. He knew how to use it to the greatest advantage, which you don't hang on to the notes if you're not trained professionally. And he did it in such a skillful way. It, it just come off great. So yeah. he had a good singing voice that he knew how to use it to its greatest advantage. But... Uh, now, and then in eight, 1989, he did Look Who's Talking with Kirstie Alley. Kirstie Alley, yeah. Now, I understand that made a lot of money from them. Is that, is that correct, or am I just... Yeah, apparently it did make a lot of money. Uh-huh, yeah. So that, that yeah. was the next thing. But then, what happened then? Then his career tanked, and it was really, really known in the Scientology world. John was not getting movie offers. He went into a complete lull. Till Primary Colors, his career went. He was so sort of, not destitute, but so hungry to perform again. Do you know something? He accepted only $150,000 to play in Quentin. Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, that's peanuts as far as a, a, a actor of his skill and stature. But actually, if you look at it as an investment, it's like buying gold when it was thirty-five dollars an ounce. So that really <laughs> turned his career around, didn't it? It did. Do you remember that famous scene? I still flinch when I think of it. When there's kind of almost an Ice pick was pierced into this girl's ah. heart. Ooh, she had gone comatose on heroin or something. And I know this was a ugh, that was okay. I, I'm going to give you. A little, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little inside skinny on what happened before he took that role. Oh, do please and do. I'm, I'm not going to mention names because the person who advised them was a very good friend of mine who's mm -hmm. out of Scientology right now, and I, I don't want to, you know, throw him under the bus for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. John came up and met with this individual, and he would, I guess he'd occasionally do this, but this is the one time I heard that he actually did it. He asked this person, as far as they were concerned, what they would advise him to do. And he told him about the role. He said, listen, I'm going to be a heroin addict, I'm going to be a hitman for the mob. <laughs> Do you think I should take this role? The guy said to him, no, John, I don't think you should. <laughs> now, going against the grain, he took the role and it turned his career around. Mm -hmm. But could you imagine somebody who knows nothing about the movie industry yeah. having that arrogance? And in those days, this person was a, a high executive you do get arrogant. I mean, beyond belief. Okay. Yeah. He told him not to take the role. And John said, 
ah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Just thought I'd bring that up because it's just a little t piece of trivia that I happen to know. And uh, could you imagine if he hadn't taken it? What the hell would yeah. he do? No. Yeah. Working What's in your, a haberdashery? I, I don't think so. That proves the point that sometimes it's wise to listen to your own heart yep. and listen to your own head. Not that people are deliberately giving you misadvice, but no. um, boy, I listen to my husband Jeffrey, but I don't listen. I get all kinds of advice fed to me and I toss it in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> well, I, I, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll listen to my wife, um, but mostly I listen to myself. Good. I, I go by what I call gut feeling or hunches, and I got to knock on wood. Right. I'm 100% right. And you know, knock on wood, that's superstitious, isn't it? <laughs> so I want you to ask me, Ron, are you superstitious? Ask me. Ron, are you superstitious? No, I'm not, Karen. I'm afraid if I were, it would give me bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. She's a good straight man. Okay. So now, he did the movie Pulp Fiction, and which, by the way, is really off in left center as far as the movie is concerned, but was truly entertaining. But then he also did another good movie called Get Shorty. Do you remember that? That I didn't see. <laughs> yeah, I did, and it was entertaining. Mm. Uh, mm. Anyway, let, let's get back on to, to him, just his role in life now. So where do we go from there? Well... The, the amount of usage the cult has milked out of John Travolta is quite interesting. What they did to manipulate President Clinton influencing Germany in exchange for a good performance, making Clinton look good in the movie Primary Colors, that, that wasn't an isolated incident. Back in the day, I don't think it's so much prevalent now. Back in the day, movie stars were supposed to get in other movie stars. And the cult hit on Travolta so that he recruited Priscilla Presley for Scientology. Mm. That's how Elvis's former wife got it. John Travolta brought her into the cult. Wow. And then Priscilla brought in Lisa, who no longer participates. Lisa Presley. So I don't think they do heck of a Did you know that Tom Cruise was head on to bring Steven Spielberg into the cult? Yes, I did when he was doing <laughs> um, that movie about Mars, right? Well, that didn't work. No. Uh, you know, Steven Spielberg is just just in a league of his own and he's proudly jewish and he's he's a wonderful just you know yeah beyond, I, beyond beyond rank and file in his in his movies so anyway um i don't think that worked out very well Ron, because you know it's <laughs> One gets so bored and so tired of hearing Scientology has John Travolta, Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Tom Cruise. Good grief. They've had these two for 30, 40 years. Yeah. They're not looking at how come there's no one, no other A-listers. In 30, 40 years, no other big name? Yeah. Come on, this Kirstie Alley and... Juliet, what, what's her last name? Juliet Lewis. Juliet Lewis. These are B list. These are C D lister. They, they, they're not household names. So the big question is how come Tom Cruise could never get any other big, big shot in? John Travolta could never get anybody. I'll tell you how they, there's both John Travolta and Tom Cruise departed Scientology for several years. They withdrew. They scuttled off into the sunset and they were corralled back in 
with absolute military precision. It was, they were too valuable to be lost. Now, Travolta had a tragic, tragic incident of the loss of his son. I know all about that, to lose, lose a son. His son had autism. And anyway, without going into all the things, John Travolta was completely captured back into the cult to give him therapy and counseling at a time of a great loss to sit in a magic bubble. This is an auditing room where a counselor has entire attention only on you and asks you to share from your soul. That can be quite powerful to some people yeah. to just be listened to and that they can, well, they think they can say anything. <clears throat> I showed you the picture of John Travolta. <laughs> he had a video camera on him and there was a video camera. The whole thing was recorded. Just one more time. I just want to show you in this corner here. Do you see a folder? Do you see it says John Travolta? Do you see that? Yep. Can you see that? In that folder is every word he says. Counselors are learned to write really fast. So everything you say in a counseling session, every word you say is on video camera and then in writing. Laughably, the cults say this is for quality control. Mm -mm. If a person tries to step out and talk about the cult, they absolutely use what you thought you said in the privacy of a session. But they alter it. They spin it. They embellish it. They make it hateful. And then they put it on the internet. Yeah. I'm really trying to warn people who even consider any church counseling, what you say, if you decide to leave Scientology and speak out, will be on an internet site. Yep. And the uh, priest penitent, pen, penitent uh, uh, does not apply at all. No, no. Because Hubbard wrote a policy called fair game. Yep. And if you're a critic of Scientology, you can be lied to, cheated, Destroyed, destroyed, yeah, destroyed. A religious leader who actually said destroy. <laughs> you know, you and I have talked. Where is where is the kindness? Where is the love? Where is the benevolence? Right? Yeah, but how about, the, how about a religious leader that would stick a little boy in a chain locker overnight? I, I tell you, Karen. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to make myself do it. I'd have to be threatened with a gun or something, but I just, it, there's no compassion. A little kid, defenseless. And I heard that when that kid come out, he was saying, I, I will never do it again. Just pleading that this would never happen to again. This, this is, this is bad stuff. This is not some uh, servant of his that did it or some underling. This is L. Ron Hubbard did that. So that boy, Eric, that boy was only seven years old Man. and he was in the chain locker for three days, oh, wetting, wetting himself, soiling himself. Um, the chain locker is, uh, I, I got to explain this to people who are not nautical souls, who haven't been on ships. When a ship is in a port, it has to drop an anchor to hold it. Waters can be very turbulent, and this anchor right into the soil underneath secures the ship. But this anchor, when pulled out, it coils itself round and round and round so that it's compact and is kept in a lower hold of the ship called the chain locker. 
Yeah. Because the anchor is held by a chain. Right. Now, if that chain suddenly sprung loose and unwound itself and somebody was in there, they would be shredded worse than a washing machine. <laughs> because once the chain unwinds, it hurls itself round and round. And this little room with no toilet was used as a punishment room. By the way, Ron, this boy, Derek, the seven-year-old, he was not the only child put in the chain locker. Uh, there's a South African guy who posts on my group called Outer Banks, on a Facebook group. And he was the son of Monica Quirino, an everlasting LRH Khan. I remember him from England. Oh, you remember him? But wasn't it Philip Carino? Yes, yes, Philip. You know, Philip, Philip has Philip has dementia and is uh, like most people who have been in Scientology fifty years. <laughs> yeah. He he has um, Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that, and he's in some rest home hidden out of view. That's Philip. Wow. So anyway, Monica's kid, who married Shelley in South Africa. He was thrown overboard as well at seven years old. He was tossed over the side of the ship at seven years. He was seven and a half years old. He he told it all and out, and he was put in the chain locker. Maybe he was sick. So this was a a repeating punishment, not just a one shot punishment. Yeah, and and Karen, let me. I've got to add something to this because one time when. You know, I was part of the Golden Era Musicians, and we used to go to the ship to perform. Yeah. And one year, we were sent down, and we had birthing in the lower part of the ship. And there's like three bunks tall and about 12 of us in a small room. And in the middle of the night, <clears throat> I guess the ship had docked, and they let loose of the anchor. And Ooh. that things because we were right next to the chain locker mm. what the hell is happening it sounded like the end of the world was coming and that's what it was the chain being loose now i can't imagine being yeah. in that room when that happened because you know I, maybe some people would have a heart attack and die it was horrendous anyway I just add a little color to it i had my own personal experience. no 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 i'm glad you chimed in on that you see, this is this is the fatal flaw of Scientology and Hubbard. Very often you can boil it down to a fatal flaw, meaning something cannot be sustainable because the flaw is so big that it can't survive. The reason Scientology cannibalizes its own staff and its own public and its own is it absolutely uses one tool to manage or handle you, and that is punishment. Yeah, you're right. Punishment with domination. It's all hierarchical. Yeah. So, so the, instead of having a sit down, let's coach you know you 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 screwed up you did a little something wrong here now let's sit down and talk it out let's see let's see you see <laughs> hubbard wrote these huge issues on qual qual was the division in scientology that was supposed to correct there's no correction no it's sadism in punishment it's absolutely horrific. Scientology, you know what? If there was no Scientology abuse, there wouldn't be shows like this. There would be nothing, to, there would not be blogs, there would not be Tony or Plato Daily, there yep. would not be excellent message boards, there wouldn't be Google, there wouldn't be Twitter tweets on their horror show, there wouldn't be YouTube videos on abuse. It comes down to the word abuse is synonymous with Scientology. Yeah, yes, it is. Yet, in a, an issue, a policy letter called Essay on Management, L. Ron Hubbard said in that issue, punishment drive does not work. 
Yeah. It is the willingness of the person to begin with that keeps him going. And it's in spite of the punishment. He wrote this. And as far as I'm concerned, when he wrote it, he wrote it to sound good. But <laughs> it wasn't the way he was, in fact, because punishment is universally used to, quote, handle, unquote, people. You know, Ron, that was it. That was very good that you did that, said that. For every single thing Hubbard has written, I can show you an equal and contrary, diametrically opposed yeah. datum that he also wrote. Yep. He wrote, what is greatness and how you should forgive and be big and benign and kind and show humanity. And then the reverse is, do you remember that horrible thing he wrote on how you escalate punishments and you make it so bad and so drastic and so much, have so much impact. The, so, the words are too gruesome. You remember that? Gruesome. That's the thing. Too gruesome. Good on you. Yep. That's it. So I'm telling you whether Hubbard was a dichotomy of good and evil or he was schizophrenic or whatever, but no matter what you throw at me, Ron, I can show you an equal and contrary thing that Hubbard wrote, which yep. opposed and diametrically contradicted what he previously said so there you go which story do you believe today yeah. which policy do you believe today you know back to john travolta if john or tom cruise could spend one day in a punishment scenario like the rehabilitation part if they could clean the bilges if they were humiliated with a one, if they could experience, never mind experiencing it for a week, if they could have one day of Scientology gangbang therapy where five people scream at you and you are made into a dot, um, you are humiliated where you your universe collapses and shrinks. I think, you see, John Travolta never has a, he doesn't even, I don't think he even knows such stuff. Although he did question Spanky being in the RPF, he couldn't, he didn't know how horrible the RPF is, but he, you know, Spanky was his right-hand man. Yeah. And he did protest. <clears throat> I think there wasn't there a little clip about that in the movie Going Clear? You know, I don't remember. I, I don't. Remember. Yeah. But I know this Spanky's a hell of an individual. She's a real nice person. Mm. Spanky's wonderful. So, so here's the thing. John Travolta, Cruz, they have a completely different paradigm, which is the viewpoint in which they view Scientology, based on their Molly Codling their champagne and caviar edition of Scientology. That's all they've ever experienced. Yeah. Travolta, whom I really think is a really good human being, is completely misguided. And when someone asked him if he had seen Leah Romani's show, The Aftermath, he said, why would I even want to see that? Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Yeah. He's blinded to looking at both sides. So he's lost all ability to even look at anything negative. He won't. He won't. You know, uh, that, that is a real problem, not just with John, but people who are Scientologists who are Yes. So indoctrinated into it. I don't know how some of these people could ever enlighten themselves because you have to, somebody can tell you something, but until you say, okay, I'm going to investigate this. I'm going to see if this is true. You have to want to see if what you're doing is correct. 
Mm. That possibility in most Scientologists does not exist in their minds. It doesn't even exist that they could possibly be wrong about it. And that is a hell of a problem. And of course, thank God that there are shows like uh, Aftermath and, you know, Chris Shelton has a show and Aaron Smith Levin and you and good. I'll give myself credit for doing this. We're, we're trying to enlighten people just to get that little opening in their eye and thinking, well, I wonder if any of this stuff he's telling us is true. And once you get that little crack opened and they say, well, I'm going to check it out for myself. Uh, then, then we've made some headway, but it's, it's a hell of a problem. And it would like John Travolta saying that I can understand his feeling. I would like to respond to that, but you made some good points there. Remember that in Scientology, you are forbidden with atomic brand iron. Yep. To look at the internet or to read anything negative or to see a movie like like uh, Louis Thoreau's My Scientology movie, Going Prayer. You cannot. And if you do, it can cost you $50,000 in yeah. parents' such confessionals. You're now going to have to sit and be questioned on crimes because only a criminal would want to see that. Yeah. So there's a lockdown where you are not allowed to look or view that. This is unsustainable. But I'll tell you what it does do wrong. Yeah. The newer generation that they try to lure in, newbies, Google is their friend. Yeah. So they're talked into going and talked into this and that and the other. And then, boom, they never heard of again. They looked up Google. They read the horror stories and they vanish into the sunset. Yeah. So that's where Scientology is really bleeding. I mean, I needed something done in my rose garden and I was looking for certain lighting. And the first thing I did was look at the reviews of people that do lighting and were customers satisfied yeah. with the landscape art. So it, it, it's just before you hire, you Google. And that's where Scientology really hurts. Now, I wanted to, to tell you another little anecdote about Travolta. There is a sort of a deadly, deadly business in Tampa, Florida called MGE, Management Something Experts. And this organization exists to lure in dentists. Dentists are a cash business. They see a person, they pay. They see a person, they pay. There's cash flowing constantly. Right, right. So they lure in dentists promising a hundred new clients a month, promising to make them millionaires. <laughs> they buy mailing lists of dentists. They go into dental associations and they lure in dentists. And they sell L. Ron Hubbard tech. L. Ron Hubbard administrative tech to dentists. These courses like are like $125,000 a course. <laughs> really? And yes, yes. And dentists pay. And then the story changes from, we're going to help your dental office to, you need to go to Clearwater and handle your baggage in your case. And you need to change the world with a mega donation to IAS. Of course, percentage of dentists flee. There are even some dentists that have done videos available on YouTube. But John Travolta was offered as a <laughs> the at a conference, the dentists were told, Would you like to have dinner with John Travolta? $25,000. And there was a dentist whose wife thought, oh, my God, a K-1 
candlelight dinner where John Travolta and his wife and, and, and me and my husband, anyway, the $25,000 was paid. And then the dinner at the Fort Harrison was with 12 different people. <laughs> wow. 12 different executives and troubled. So it wasn't this private dinner. And this is the dentist. I want to hold this up correctly. He put it on Facebook. Just lower it no, just a slight bit. Is that better? No, lower it just a little bit more. Oh, yeah, because this is. There you go. Oh, yeah. You got, yeah. You, you got to keep talking or it comes back. Okay. So, so, so basically, he did get his picture taken with John Travolta, but this cost him $25,000. And then the bait and switch was he didn't have a personal dinner with John Travolta. He had a general dinner with 12 people and Travolta happened to be at the table. Wow. Now, now that's not the point of this. The, the, this happened maybe three, four years ago. Okay. Yeah. The point is that John with his good heart and his, the soft side of him can be lured into doing this kind of nonsense and rubbish. And you know what? The money is never accountable. There's no transparency as to what happened with that $25,000. Scientology has nothing that it shows as to where the money goes. There's a thing called Charity Navigator. Charity Navigator completely endorses charity-free 501c3 entities because they supply their books to show how much went on expense and to the payroll of those who work there and how much went to the actual activity. You know, I'm, yeah. I, I'm very big with the American Humane Society and the American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Right. And you can see how much they spend on the animals. Animals. Yeah. The welfare of animals as opposed to the big fat monies given. Uh, is there any way you could just chime in and say a couple of words on your son, David Miscavige? Um, he does live like a Saudi king, right? Well, I don't know about a Saudi king, but I'll tell you, <laughs> he does live like a king. It's just... Uh, and. I, I give you a, just one little example. Uh, at the Hammett base, that's the international base or what they call gold. There is a ship that is built there. It's called the star of California. It's built on land. So if you were driving down a road, you'd see a, like a three master ship. You're thinking, what the hell is this? It's really unique. There's a swimming pool next to it. And in that ship, in the, the cabins or the, the rooms, there is a kitchen there that is basically where his chef makes his meals. And there's a locker that's probably six feet wide. And from the ground up, it's probably seven feet tall, full of delicacies that his food is kept in there. I don't know who it was that told me this. It could have been one of the girls that worked for him, that his food bill per week was about a thousand dollars a week. For food. Well, two thousand dollars a week. According to Lana, do you remember Lana, his chef in RTC, Lana oh, yeah. Mitchell? L Lana Mitchell, yeah. She's the one that uh, somehow was blamed for the bad chicken and Tom Cruise yeah. growing up and being sick, and then she was deported to Australia or something. Yeah. Yeah. She escaped. Okay, $2,000 a week. Now, he's, he mentions... He, he doesn't have to have the money of a king or a Saudi Arabian dictator. As an example, he mentioned one time that he wouldn't mind having a BMW. So Monique Yangling worked it out hmm. so that the pro for-profit group in Los Angeles, which is Author Services, they sell L. Ron Hubbard's books for a profit so that people there 
get minimum wage and uh, they're not considered a religious group. Monique Yangling worked it out so that the people who work there would get a huge bonus and the total amount of all their bonuses was enough to buy a BMW for over $100,000 and give it as a gift to David for his birthday or some special occasion, things like that. And it's just, yeah. it, what, what's this thing called? Usury, where you, you're showing you yeah. know, that a person is benefiting yeah. personally versus the, the public. I mean, I don't know of any activity that they, in fact, do. Look, a, lo a lot of the things they say they do are very nice, but what mm -hmm. they actually do is another thing. Like the volunteer ministers, mm -hmm. they say they're sending a team of volunteer ministers to maybe Haiti. They don't tell you that the volunteer ministers are paying their own airfare and supporting themselves down there. Yeah. We need you to believe that that's part of dona donations that you're giving to uh, one of their groups to, to fund this. That's not true. Uh, they violate any rule that has to do with you qualifying to be as a church. And as far as David is concerned, I'll tell you, he's turned from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. To take advantage of his position does lead the life of a king. You know, you and I were Sea Org members for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Do you, re do you remember how, when it was David Miscavige's birthday, Oh, everybody had a money box. was taken right out of your payroll. You were never asked. Yeah. And if payroll had been very poor, let's say you got $25 for the week. Yep. You worked your 80 hour week, you got $25. The week that $25 was needed from you for David Miscavige's birthday present, they gave you $40 that week and took out $25. Yeah. And it was David. Yeah, and and look at there's like <laughs> I remember well we used to give we used to give twenty dollars not twenty five, uh, but I think there was four hundred staff members who come to eight thousand dollars, and he would buy a suit, and uh, Larice would also get maybe a new art uh, suit, eight thousand dollars. But that's only one church. All of AOLA, all of Denmark, all of it. Each entity had to cough up their twenty. Every staff member, yeah. mandatory, had to pay because it was David Miscavige's birthday. This is this is a. There's no power of choice. No. This is we adore our guru and our leader. Yep. And you can work eighty hours that week for a pittance, but we're going to take twenty five dollars out of you. Yeah. For Miscavige. Or how about when I was on the ship, on the decks with the other musicians, and uh, we were polishing, uh, varnishing the rail on the side of the ship, and uh, there's a yacht sailing with David and Tom Cruise, $2,000 a day to do this, and they're yakking yeah. away, and just, how do you feel? Yeah. Fucking good, okay, let me tell you. But that's the way it went, and here I am now, and all the punishment, did work on me. It got rid of me. <laughs> it, it does work. You'll say one day, wait a minute. I'm a human being. I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm getting out. And then when they say, okay, you got out, but now you're not going to be able to talk to your kids ever. Well, I'll tell you what, then I'm going to expose you sons of bitches and I'm going to do everything I can to make people realize what you are as opposed to what you say you are. And People like John Travolta and Tom Cruise and Kirstie Alley and Bodie El Elfman and uh, Jenna Elfman, they believe what Scientology says it is. They don't dare open their eyes and say, wait a minute, I've been backing this thing up. Let me see what other people say about it. Could everybody be lying who has been on Ron's show for a year or the aftermath with Leah and Mike Rinder, or maybe when Aaron Smith Levin or you come on, it isn't possible for people to gather a group of people together and decide on what they're going to say. These things happen. The people I have on the show, it happened to these people. Whatever you do, keep your eyes closed. That's what Scientology is saying.
Hmm. Ron, I'm going to make a very strange statement here, and I want your take on it, and I would like you to tell me your whether you agree with this. It's, it might sound really strange and bizarre and weird. Even though I expose Scientology relentlessly, I feel it's a, almost a duty that I must take out this rotten, miserable entity. When I look back at everything I did for 40 years, I feel it was a net positive, not a net negative. Because some of the strength and resilience I have, I've continued to do better, 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 better. Every year, every 365 days, I'm in a higher range in happiness, in finance, in, in how I can help others in the amount of correspondence I do, in the impact I create. I'm better, 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 better. And I really feel that some of the work ethic and discipline, one of my most cherished, happiest things is how I help animals, abused animals. I'm just getting, I'm going into a zone, my zone on it. This is my passion. So when I look back, did Scientology crush me? Did it did it make me a mental case? Did it make me into a dot so that I was dis the dysfunctional people that get Alzheimer's and dementia, the people <laughs> and strokes, the people still in my ex-husband, Eva Jensh, can't even sit up straight. He yeah. has to be propped up according to Val Haney. So I'm doing better, 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 better. And I think, you know what? I feel, this is a bizarre statement, that my Scientology history was a net positive. What, how can you respond? What is your, was it a net negative or a net positive for you? I'm going to tell you something, Karen. I, I share that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. There is only one other thing mm -hmm. that I do want to bring up that from my, from my experience, for a short period of time, for about three months, my experience in the Marine Corps. Mm. Because when I first arrived at boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina, and the first night with the drill instructor, which was like a uh, full metal jacket. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but the drill instructor in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I can, I, I can remember saying to myself, this is the worst fucking mistake I've ever made in my life. <laughs> but I had to live through it. Three months later, I'm graduating from boot camp and I'm a kid now. I'm just turned 20, excuse me, just turned 18. I remember thinking to myself, I can make myself do anything. Mm. And that to me was for a short term, the mm. biggest gain I've ever had in self-discipline. Mm. So if anything, that was the thing that led me to be able to take all those years mm. in Scientology and take it as a net gain, as you say. Mm. But without that, it would have been, I don't know if I could, well, maybe I could have done it, but I, I got to give credit to the United States Marine Corps because you have a good positive result of what they do there. I mean, they're out to do good. They're out to protect the United States and the, the public and yeah, I'm, I'm proud to have served. I, I got to tell you right up front. OK, yeah. Uh, but when I look at my life in Scientology and especially in the C organization and when I came to the realization, I cannot live my life this way anymore mm. and plan the escape. And, uh, mm. it, of course, you know, I got to mention it's in this book here. If you haven't gotten that, you should get it and read it. I will say that that was my attitude. Mm -hmm. you're not going to take me down now that I, you've taken my family away. I'm coming after you. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a gain because not only am I helping to do what I feel is the right thing to do, but I'm helping a lot of people not go into Scientology. Mm -hmm. so my, that's my great pleasure in life mm -hmm. to help people from getting fucked over by this group mm -hmm. 
and also proof them up with little enlightenment as to watch it. Don't get involved in any cult. Mm. That's, that's a long-winded answer, but there's there's my answer to you. And Sean, my producer wants to say some. What was that, Sean? Oh, I was just gonna. You you had some donations, so when you guys start wrapping up. Okay. All right. Anyway, well, back. I want to say that my deepest regret, the biggest, the biggest crime I did this lifetime was to bring a child into this world, into that cult. And they have blood on their hands. Yeah. My son died due to the toxic policy of disconnection. And just like you say, they took away your family and you're going to keep yeah. going. They killed Alexander Jench. Yeah, I did. Until the day I die, they will be exposed. And they every dark secret place and rotten little corner will be exposed by me. They killed Alexander, and I will not let his death be in vain. And so that Alexander's death motivates me beyond anything. I, I, Karen, let me tell you something. I would not want you as my enemy. I am glad. Oh, <laughs> I thought you. I thought you thought I was a pussycat. <laughs> oh yeah, bullshit, man. <laughs> no, tiger <don't>, claws. <laughs> don't let Karen Delacarie come after you because you're in for some shit if you don't think it. Try it. Anyway, <laughs> Sean, what were you going to say? So you have a couple um, couple donations. So one from Sunny Hill G for $2. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, Danielle Demchek for a dollar. Thanks for the donation. Daniel Demchek. Dr. Phelps says uh, for 20 Danish crones, uh, have to love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. And then Sonny again for $5. Thanks, Sonny. Sonny, thank you very much. And by the way, just so I can get into the wrap up here, if any of you would like to become patrons, it would be very much appreciated because that does help us to keep the ongoing the ongoingness. I love to use, to use that word. I don't know why. But it sounds kooky, but it keeps the ongoingness of the show ongoing. <laughs> yeah. And we'll be doing a Patreon hangout soon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, by the way, there's another subject I want to get you back on for, Karen. Uh -huh. And that is the affirmations that L. Ron Hubbard made. Mm. I'd love to have you come back on and uh, yeah. have you take those apart and yeah. just yeah. keep tuned to all of you out there who are subscribers. Mm -hmm. If you're not, mm -hmm. please subscribe. If you're not a patron, sign up today and it'll be very much appreciated. And I'm going to do something a little different route. I'm going to end this with a theme. See if you can remember this. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thank you for watching. I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. I'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now. <laughs>